Welcome to the Lizzie Borden Podcast, Episode 29. I am your host, Stephanie Corey, filling in for the late Richard Behrens, author of the Lizzie Borden Girl Detective series of mysteries. The Lizzie Borden Podcast is the only podcast entirely devoted to the study of the Borden murders of 1892, Lizzie Borden, and sometimes the history of her hometown, Fall River, Massachusetts. Produced by Nine Muses Books and Anna Behrens. Each episode explores some aspect of the mystery that is Lizzie Borden, from the origins of the doggerel Lizzie Borden took an axe to a primer on the case by noted authors and experts, including dramatic readings of Richard Behrens' Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Mystery Series. In this episode, we present part two of our interview with Dennis Bennett, co-author of many of the books published by the Fall River Historical Society, including the Knowlton Papers, Women at Work, the Fall River Discourses series, the Knowlton Pearson Correspondence, the Jennings Journals, and Parallel Lives, a social history of Lizzie A. Borden and her Fall River. From his many years as assistant curator of the Fall River Historical Society, Dennis is an acclaimed expert at research and sourcing information relating to Fall River history and the life of Lizzie Borden and the Borden murders. Dennis shares his tips, techniques, stories of working on the books and research tools with us again today. And now, the Lizzie Borden Podcast presents part two of an interview with Dennis Bennett. Welcome back to number two of the conversation with Dennis Bennett from the Fall River Historical Society. To remind everyone, Dennis is a native of Fall River, and many of his earliest memories involve the enjoyment of or acquiring books. Very fortunate to have grown up with parents who encouraged his intellectual pursuits, Dennis eventually discovered the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature, which became one of his first favorite research tools. With a background in English literature, along with photography, film, studies, and filmmaking, Dennis's early career experiences were not in any of these fields, rather dealing with banking, database management, and financial analysis. Oddly enough, these areas often required fine problem-solving techniques, which in a sense is the heart of intensive research. Over 30 years ago, Dennis made his first connection with the Fall River Historical Society, where he soon joined the staff and was appointed assistant to the curator, Michael Martins. Together, the two would research, edit, write several publications, the first of which was The Commonwealth of Massachusetts versus Lizzie A. Borden, The Knowlton Papers, 1892 to 1893, which was the first collection of primary source material on the case, appearing 101 years after the trial. Most notable of their collaborations was the monument to their research skills, Parallel Lives, a social history of Lizzie A. Borden and her Fall River. Currently retired, Dennis works with the Fall River Historical Society as a consultant on various research projects and is also involved with various projects in the publishing world. He resides in Massachusetts. Welcome back, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you. We had a lot of positive feedback on your first appearance. Actually, it's not really an appearance. It's your audio self audio-ness. Audio appearance. Your uh, audio appearance. (laughs) Mostly notable, everybody liked your voice. Well, I'm glad they do. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's much better than mine, that's for sure. So we left off last time. We only ended up talking about the Knowlton Papers. Right, right. And so the next book that you worked on at the Society was the big one, considered the big one. The big one, Parallel Lives. Because it's not, not only is it very long, but it required the most research most intensive research project you've probably ever done there. Parallel Lives was a was a ten year project and definitely became much more involved as it went along than we anticipated at the very beginning. In that respect, it was a, a constant surprise uh, because we managed to uncover uh, a wealth of uh, primary source material and personal material about uh, Lizzie Borden, the woman, and also um, 
it was the first time that we could actually collect, assemble, and make available a large collection of social historical tales that had never been told or never been put down on paper. So all in all, it, it, yes, it's a Lizzie Borden book, and yes, Lizzie Borden is in the title, but the book stands as the first social history of the city of Fall River, and that surrounds a biography of Lizzie Borden. And it just so happens that it covers her years. <clears throat> so it starts in like around 1860, a little bit before then to this, you know, the setting up of the city, but it because the social part of it starts like around 1860 and then goes to her death or right after her death into 1928 with the Great Fire where Lizzie died in 27. So, but her life encompasses the story. Right, and, and that's where the title Parallel Lives came from. And uh, when Michael sat down with me and, and we tried to uh, come up with a scheme uh, for what this book was actually going to be, because we knew what we didn't want it to be. It wasn't going to be a whodunit. Uh, it wasn't going to be another one of the rehashes of, of everything that um, there was about the trial. We wanted it to actually portray Lizzie as a human being. And the city itself also, And the right? city itself. Uh, uh, as a place where people lived and died and worked and right. enjoyed it, themselves. It, the, the city had a, has a, a wonderful history, and that's what Parallel Lives became. It, it was the city of Fall River's life wrapped around the life of Lizzie Borden. Right, who chose never to leave that city when, right. when she was acquitted. It was her home. And that says a lot, you know, because mm -hmm. she could have gone anywhere, done anything. She could have gone to Paris and been a cause celeb. I mean, Josephine <laughs> Baker did that, right? Yeah, well, yeah. All the kind of naughty ones, all the infamous people went to Paris. Yeah, just what you've been through. I mean, it's people just want to meet you at a cocktail cocktail right. party, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was always said that she was a very good conversationalist, so I'm sure she would have made out fine in that respect. Well, why uh, did you encounter anybody in your travels who had had conversations with Lizzie Borden? Yes. Okay, now we'll get to that in a minute. Mm -hmm. But how did you, I mean, you have at the society resources, gazillion resources. You have, you have name files, which we talked about before. You have newspapers on microfilm, although back then you didn't, right? right? You had to go to uh, New Bedford Library and you had to go to the Fall River Public Library. Right. You had city directories. You had famous men and women. I'm oh, sorry, not women. Who, they didn't care about <laughs> There were women. no famous women no. in the 19th century. <laughs> uh, famous men of uh, Massachusetts, uh, prominent men of Bristol County. You know, right. so you're getting biographical information about people. But the day-to-day -day stuff, is, is that kind of a combination of newspaper and personal stories and oral histories that the Historical Society already contains, like diaries. Uh, now we're talking about the social history of Fall River, Yes, correct? the social history. Okay, yes. Um, that is a conglomeration of, God, any number of things that we had access to uh, through the Historical Society's records. There's a huge collection of scrapbooks there, and uh, it's interesting to see what people pay attention to and save. Of course, <laughs> a different person is going to save different articles about different people. Mm -hmm. So there's a tremendous resource there. We have papers that were written by various members of the Historical right. Society that are all on file. Some of those we've published. We also have diaries, letters. So correspondence and diaries of people you may not have checked out before. Right. And, as connected to this story. Right. And, and you don't know what you're really looking for sometimes until you look for something and you find something else. Okay, that was... Does my, that, that make was, any sense? That was going to be the thing. <laughs> like, how did you know? I mean, I figure you know that it's a history, so it's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. Right. In terms of its scope and chronology. But the people you included run from the upper class, the mill owners down to, and I don't mean down as a negative way, but it is below the hill. So we're talking about people who worked 
with their hands barefoot in the mills, mm -hmm. you know, so you've got this wide range of stories that are being told. It's not just the rich folks, you know, the the, the gentry, the the money class of Fall River. No, no. it's it's every story. It's every story, and uh, it's amazing what you find. Uh, there were some heartbreaking stories. Oh yeah. Uh, there was uh, the story of Ellen Dunn. Yes. Uh, she was a woman that lived off of Bedford Street in a tenement, and um, eight and a half street was it? Six and a half. Six and a half. Six Sorry. and a half street. Who went into a drunken tirade and screamed out a third story window that she was going to throw her baby out to the crowd. All the people from the neighboring tenements were out there and they were all horrified by what was going to happen. Her poor 12-year-old son was there and couldn't do anything. And she hurled a baby out of a third story window. Caught, right? Sort of. Uh, she was arrested. No, but the baby was sort of caught. The baby it, died. Yeah, but... Yeah, it, the baby horribly uh, bounced off a banister That's right. and uh, hit the ground and a woman... Uh, brought it to her apartment, and of course, <laughs> the first uh, thing that they you know, could think of to give the baby was brandy. <laughs> but um, it uh, unfortunately passed away. Ironically, or oddly, um, I should say, when Michael and I went to Superior Court and had the docket pulled uh, and read what actually transpired at the trial, the judge threw the case out of court. Why? We have no idea. She w she never served a term oh, at wow. all. Wow. So she was never convicted on the murder of her child? No. It was one of those moments where, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you get to the end of the research and you, your whole insides just go. Ugh. They put people in the hooskow for uh, being inebriated. Yeah. You know, you drink too much, you pay a fine. And if you can't have the, if you can't pay the fine, you go to jail mm -hmm. for several days or a week or a month, often a month. But she served no time. No time. No. That's weird. It must have been a backstory. But but there were there were any number of of, of stories uh, that little snippet articles that uh, show up when you're looking for something else right. in the paper. The two headed baby, the man, the father who was selling uh, tickets. Uh, on Lindsay Street in Fall River to, uh, for people to come see his or wife had given birth to a two-headed baby. Um, oh <laughs> you know, they, 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 uh, police quickly put a kibosh on that one. <laughs> Why? Why was he... Why can't he show off his little child? Well, I think that it's probably something that was just considered not morally oh, correct. Oh, okay, about that. but it's not illegal. Oh, I don't think so. Unless he didn't have a license in order to collect. Well, well it's hard to income. find precedent. I would. Think. <laughs> it's not something that happens I'm every sorry. day. I'm sorry. I don't mean to laugh at the situation because it sounds horrific to the family, but I don't understand. You know, I always ask, like, what's the legal side of this story? Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, but Parallel Lives grew as we proceeded with our research in a good way. We uncovered a lot of interesting material about the people of Fall River. I should say that uh, you mentioned chronology before. Structurally, the book is unusual in that it's not a chronological history for the first half. It deals with themes. It sets you up at the beginning with the Borden family uh, coming to Fall River, right. coming to America. The ancestors, yes. yes. But then it moves through themes. Uh, uh, matrimony is one particular chapter. Oh, and, that's right. Yeah. yeah, and then it's not until it gets to Chapter 11, actually, when the Lizzie Borden's trial comes up. And from that point on, it chronologically follows from 1893 until 1928. But before that, it's uh, her story is kind of woven in with other stories of, of people in the city, uh, some of them quite fantastic. Well, she was hard to pin down before the murders as a person who existed in the society. Mm -hmm. Her father was more famous than she was before that time, and he was in the paper more than she was for his land transactions and for his selling of, what did he do? He sold cows in the newspaper because he had a farm in Swansea, so he right. would put a little And he had in. the furniture business. And he had the furniture business, so he had advertising. And also, so he had a presence. And then Lizzie's just this person who 
didn't keep a diary. Let me repeat that, who did not keep a diary. Uh So if you say that you've read one, it's fiction, just the audience so that they know that. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know how many times people have said to me that they've read Lizzie's diary. No, that's a fictional diary account in a book. Okay. I, I, it's uh, uh, while we're on that subject. Uh, the other thing is that uh, I find it very hard to believe that somebody could be a direct descendant of a woman oh, who never married. Right. Yeah. There's no such thing as a direct descendant of Lizzie Borden. Let's put that away as well. You can't be, no matter how many times you say it out loud. It's not true. She had no children. Emma had no children. There were no offspring beyond those two women right in and that side of the family uh, to go back but to, you could be cousins for sure mm-hmm. but to go back to what you were saying before about uh andrew borden versus lizzie borden yes um andrew was more of a presence in fall river uh it was a director uh, of um the union savings bank and uh, lizzie was just another woman who never worked Right. In her whole life, but she volunteered. She volunteered. So at her church. presence is known as it, her good deeds. Mm-hmm. So that's what she did. That's what Emma did. That's what they did. And let's not call them girls. <laughs> <laughs> They're grown women. Yes. Emma's at the time of the murders is forty, and Lizzie's thirty-two. But they always called them the girls. Uh-huh. And I always, it rubbed me the wrong <laughs> way. It's like because I you say girls and you think. 12 year old uh-huh. you know before puberty anyway so parallel lives okay how did you know who to contact or to try to contact when it came to lizzie and your research because all of this in here is new except maybe the the case itself the crime itself mm-hmm Everybody knows about that and has read about that. There's nothing spectacularly crazy new about that. What's all brand new about Lizzie in this book is her childhood, her teen years, her education, and then what happened after, including very big detail how they picked a house to live in after Second Street and those kinds of things. But how did you flesh her out and how did you know who to contact to do that? Because nobody was talking to anybody about her that knew her until you. Right. I was the new kid on the block as far as uh, the historical society was concerned because Michael had been there for years and years before I came on board. He knew. He was aware of various people that factored oh, yeah. into the story that uh, could be contacted. That was the starting point. So he knew descend- He knew descendants. He knew descendants. And uh, so that became the starting point. Through that and through research uh, into other aspects of her life, and I'm talking especially after the acquittal, little hints uh, appeared here and there, to, uh, points to follow up on. And there was a Washington, D.C. connection. Why? And then so then we found out about some people down in the Washington, D.C. area. Okay, that's an avenue to, to track. Her doctor, her personal doctor, was from Nova Scotia. She was in Fall River, returned to Nova Scotia. Okay, there's another path to follow. Descendants of people or people that were connected to those that were members of Lizzie's household again or staff another avenue to follow so it was just it it was basically trying to zero in on these people and figuring out how to zero in did you take the will Uh, the will yes pick it apart and try to find people that way yes but that was not a, 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 a first go to. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. No, not. A, that is for a lot of people and has been for a lot of people, but that was not the first go to because there were so many other avenues to pursue. Well, in thinking of, you said, uh, anybody that would have um, had a conversation with her, yes, we did meet the last person that we knew of that was alive that had known Lizzie Borden. She has since uh, since passed, but uh, she and her husband were gracious enough to have Michael and I into her home and their home. 
and she had some stories to tell about Lizzie and picnics that um, mm. they went on. And it was through that family that we received uh, photographs that appear in parallel lives of Lizzie on a picnic, which is a whole different side. Um, and that was that, that that was the pleasure about of working on that book was that we weren't like I said we weren't trying to solve a whodunit. We were trying to find out about a woman uh, and find out things about her character and her personality that uh, never ever were known before. Right. And the interesting thing that I think says a lot about the people that we dealt with is that they, in many cases, are sitting on tremendous primary source material, actually, uh, that have to ha- has to do with Lizzie Borden's life, personal life. And they are hesitant to talk to people because they've seen what has been done in the past. Mm-hmm. And they are very careful, and they take great pride in having the things that they have because, and this is what I really admire about these people, they love Lizzie Borden as much as their ancestors do. And they honor her memory the way their ancestors would have wanted them to. They're not selling things off to cash in on Lizzie Borden. That was a part of their family and their family's history. And these are the people that came forward for us. And I. Well, because it was the society, for one, because it was a reputational, your reputation preceded you and your fairness and the idea that you were writing a non judgmental book about everyone in it. You know, right. there's no judgment against, against or for anything. You don't solve the case. You don't, it's it's a part of the story. It is not the story. And it's not what the book is about. So for people to open up to you finally that never wanted to talk or never was were asked to talk before about it, mm-hmm. it seems reasonable that it would be the society that gets that, that entrance, that opening of the door because of your reputation preceded you through that door as a as a it wasn't some somebody saying i'm writing a book can i talk to you right and uh, well there's one instance that actually you um yeah you kind of witnessed at the tail end uh, and that's where we uncovered um a family that had some correspondence. The woman, I think, was a great niece of of uh, someone that was mentioned in the book, and um, uh, she said, "Oh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I I have a couple of letters uh, uh, from Lizzie Borden that were sent to uh, w- one of her ancestors." And uh, she said, "Next time I go to the bank, I'll get them there in a safe deposit box." Oh, okay, fine. So. Uh, Day came around that uh, she came into the historical society and uh, met with Michael, and I was on the other side in uh, the office, and basically she had a Ziploc bag with a couple of letters in it, and then um, Michael was, ooh, ah, you know, these are great, and um, she said, and I think you might be interested in these as well, and she had a tote bag. (laughs) with letters on it and um, no, in it and so after the meeting um, Michael and I spread out the letters there were I think 48 oh. pieces of correspondence and this is when you came in at one point and uh, we said Stephanie we have something here we want you to take a look at <laughs> and you were like <gasps> I know well uh-huh. I did that a lot uh-huh. <laughs> I did that a lot especially the photograph of her older that Michael said, Who do, who's this look like? And I said, it looks like my mother, because it does. But she's like somebody's auntie. And he goes, I can't believe you said that. There's a whole story behind that photograph that has to, that, that puts me in very stupid light. <laughs> we had made contact with this man um, out in the um, Southwest. And he was the grandson of a very 
close friend of Lizzie's, contacted him, and I spoke with him for quite some time. He was telling me about the Borden family. Yes, he had some family things in a box that he had not gone through in a long time. He was going to take a look and see what was there and whatever. And then finally, I, I, I mentioned something about the murder, and he said, murder? He said, what murder? Oh, my. So I explained, and he said, oh, he said, I thought that my grandmother was friendly with the Bordens who had the dairy in New Jersey. <laughs> I said, no, it was the Bordens in Fall River, Massachusetts. And he says, oh. Anyway, he ended up going through some and sent some things to the Historical Society. And um, one was a photograph in a folio. And I was looking at it, and I saw the, his grandmother's initials were written at the bottom. And I was looking at the picture, and I said, I said Michael, I said, this doesn't look anything like any of the other pictures of his grandmother. And Michael said, let me see it. And so I gave him the photograph, and he just looked up at me. And he said, who is this? And I said, I don't know. And he said, "Who? what is this woman sitting in front of? And she, it was a woman in a white dress holding a Boston Terrier, sitting in front of a fieldstone chimney. And I said... Oh, a Maple Cross chimney. And he said, right. And so then we looked at the face and, oh, oh my God, yes, it was Lizzie Borden <laughs> holding one lady. of her dogs. Yeah, little old lady. Yeah, with white hair. As it happened, we came across the same photograph through a different family that was not connected at all with the family that had provided the photograph for our collection. So every time you turned a corner, there was one week, well, well a two-week period, I would say, that... Almost every day when we went into work, there was either a message from someone on the phone or something in the mail that had to do with more info for the book. Oh, to be a fly on the wall. <laughs> I remember he said, you know, and I said, he goes, uh, why did you call her auntie? I go, I don't know. It just looks like somebody's auntie. And he goes, as a matter of fact, she was known as Auntie Borden. Auntie Borden. And I was like, no way. Yeah. I got that right, right, right off the bat. Yeah. But she did look just like my mother. <laughs> the, 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 but little like sweet things um, having to do with character. The, this, this collection, this particular collection of letters, uh, several of them were written to uh, two little girls, Anna Victoria and Olga, two girls of Swedish descent that Lizzie had befriended. Birthday cards that were sent to the girls. And it was interesting because it says something about Lizzie. All of the birthday cards that the girls had saved were sent special delivery mail. So when you think about that, it's, okay, the doorbell rings, and it's a mailman. But it's not a mailman with a bunch of mail for the whole family. The doorbell is ringing just for that one little girl on her special day. And that's how Lizzie treated birthdays for the, for the little children in her life. So do you think that comes from a person who celebrated her own birthday? as a child or didn't celebrate her own birthday as a child? I would almost say didn't. And that's just an assumption. But because we don't know if they celebrated holidays, Christmas, Thanksgiving, uh, right, right? We don't know what their own holiday life was about. Or like I said, nobody kept a diary in that family. So they couldn't mm -hmm. write down what they did that day. No, and and it's it's difficult to picture Andrew Borden coming home from work on Christmas Eve with a sand hat on. You know, things like that. Well, <laughs> just... oh, come on. Ebenezer Scrooge worked out just fine. <laughs> but, in uh, the end. No, it, but with, um, the birth, but with what you said about celebrating things, Lizzie wrote a letter to the mother of, of these two girls at one point, and the woman had given her uh, tea towels that she had embroidered herself. And Lizzie sent a note thanking her, and she said, please, you don't have to give me anything. She said, I just enjoy giving to you. So I think that that was where Lizzie had her joy, was not in the receiving. No, no, I didn't think that It at was all. definitely in the giving. Yeah. Well, she was a, a benefactor for many people, and in some cases college education yes you know a, yeah. a medical degree uh and um an architectural mm -hmm. uh, degree in one case and little known fact we found out from um the mcfarland 
family that at Adams Bookstore, which was a very popular bookstore and stationer in Fall River, Lizzie sort of had an account with them. And if they knew of anyone that could not afford books, that Lizzie would pay for them for anyone that could not afford books that wanted to read. Oh, wow. Well, that's kind of cute. I like that story. Yeah, it just, so it's it's amazing what you find out if you go poking around and looking. Right. And uh, fortunately, we had the umbrella of the Historical Society to kind of rest under and uh, do our research. The last person that was alive when Lizzie was alive. See, I should have been there. Because <laughs> you never ask the questions I want to know. Like, why I wanted to know was what did her voice sound like and when she moved did she waddle did she glide did she dance in small steps you know did she skip around did she have a sense of humor did she laugh what was her laugh like you know I would want to know those things more than anything else because I want to hear and see her and I mean did she have like a Fall River accent I mean did she have a high-pitched voice or a low-pitched voice? You know, yeah. It, it, and you guys never asked her that. No, I, I, but I do think she had a sense of humor. There is a letter, and I'm trying to think of what collection it's in, where she's writing and she talks about this woman's son. So it must be the Lindsay collection. Something about eating beans in the dining room and laughing hysterically at that story. So I can only assume eat, <laughs> eating beans in, a, in a, a close area of what Lizzie was laughing about. <laughs> but so that would, would, would lead me to believe that, yes, she did have a sense of humor. <laughs> okay. But th- there are very few points of that because she was guarded, right? Mm-hmm. She was very proper in her own way. Yes, right. yes. Another great find there, and talking about uh, the threads that you have to follow sometimes. Michael knew that there was a descendant somewhere of um, Mrs. Anna Lindsay, who was Mrs. William Lindsay. Anna was Mary Ella Sheen Brigham's sister. Now, Mary Ella Sheen Brigham was the mother-in-law of Mrs. Brigham, who was the curator prior to Michael at the Historical Society. And this Mariella was a character witness for Lizzie at the trial. She basically held Lizzie's hand throughout the ordeal. And her sister had ended up in uh, uh, houses in Boston and England. Her husband was very successful with a cartridge belt that he invented. You mean for bullets? Uh, for the war, mm. uh, for the first war. The grand, the granddaughter w- was in Italy, in Rome. That's all we knew. So Michael went back looking through papers, 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 and found her name and a street in Rome. Now, having had experience with the Italian post office. It's not known for being efficient. Uh, So Michael dashed off a letter to this woman with her street name and Rome. No postal code. In it was a letter including his email address. And believe it or not, within a week, Mm. he had an email from this woman. (laughs) So whoever delivered this letter managed to get it to its destination. That's how we came upon the uh, letters that were written by Lizzie when she was in prison. Right. Again, she apparently had some sort of a sense of humor. She had a prison cat uh, that was a mouser. It was a male cat called Daisy. <laughs> so <laughs> she asked uh, Mrs. Lindsay to uh, please stop sending me chocolates. I guess she was getting OD'd on chocolates while she was in prison. She grew strawberries on the windowsill of her cell. So we get a very personal look rather than a look of Lizzie through the eyes of the press while she was in prison, which gives us a totally, totally different look oh, yeah. at her. She was terrified. She was absolutely she was, terrified. When you, when you read the letters, you get a sense that she had no idea what her future held. She had no idea whether she was going to be convicted or not. She had, she seemed 
blue and contemplative, but sad and unsure. It wasn't like, oh, yeah, my lawyer said it's going to be fine and I don't need to worry. You know, there was none of that. It was all, I don't know what tomorrow will bring. I don't know how this is going to turn out. It's uh, there. uh, There are a few instances in the letters that uh, really give you a a look at her mindset at the time. Uh, One was uh, she confesses that her attorneys don't even give her any hope going forward uh, as to what would happen. The other thing is she felt like she was at ebb tide. And in another letter, I feel like they're going to be soon bringing me down the street to the lunatic asylum. So that's the, where uh, she was mentally uh, while she was in prison. The papers that she would, was cold, that she was unemotional. Um, right. She was terrified. Yeah. She was. I can imagine. I mean, I can't, but I can. You know, I can pretend that I can feel what it must be like to be alone. Now your sister's coming to visit you frequently and you've got your minister coming to visit you and your lawyer mm-hmm. is coming to visit you and and it's it's not your food is being provided <laughs> yeah. locally instead of prison food. So she had some uh, benefits to her class. And she also had um, a benefit in that uh, sheriff and Mrs. Wright, who he was sheriff of Bristol County, and his wife uh, was the prison matron. Hannah was that her name? Uh, I can't remember what her first name. No, was. that's Hannah Reagan. That's yeah, the Hannah, one from Fall oh, no, River. Yeah, she was from Fall River. Uh, but anyway, the Wrights had lived on Ferry Street when Lizzie was growing up, and they had a daughter, Isabella Lizzie's age, who was a playmate of hers. So when uh, Lizzie pulled up in the carriage at the prison Mrs. Wright and the sheriff greeted her and Mrs. Wright burst into tears and said oh Lizzie Lizzie and took her and hugged her now that is not the usual treatment (laughs) that you're going to be getting from a prison matron so when Lizzie again came down with bronchitis after having gone to New Bedford and staying in prison there during the arraignment Mrs. Wright took her into their household until she was nursed back to health. So she was cared for uh, very especially when she was in prison. Uh, It's the same old story. Those that knew her loved her. Those that knew her from when she was a child to when she was older. Who physically, emotionally knew her through friendships, through relationships in her household, and the numbers of people she employed in her lifetime. Uh, Those families speak only positively about her. There was a family, one of her chauffeurs, that uh, his family was in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. And uh, again, these little things that you find out. um, When Lizzie used to travel to New York or Boston, she would go to S.S. Pierce because this chauffeur, Norman, I think his name was, Mm -hmm. liked the certain types of nuts that S.S. Pierce sold. And she always, every time she went there, she bought him some nuts. And when she would go out and visit on his farm in uh, Portsmouth, she would play with the children there. The children loved her. They absolutely loved her. It's so it the the whole thing is such an enigma. It is it really, really is. when you look at it, look at the person, and you look at the circumstance that she became enwrapped in. It's it's uh, it's amazing to try to reconcile one with the other. It it really is not to say that she was innocent or she was guilty, uh, but to try to put. the person that you've come to know in the position that she ended up being in at 32 years old. She was taken advantage of after the fact that we know that. Nance O'Neill, there's such a big deal made out of of the relationship. that It was probably about three months long. It was also financial. It was financial. Uh, Because uh, she hung out, her producer was McKee Rankin, and he was so famous for glomming on to rich people and being entertained by them because that's where 
he got the money to fund his productions. Right, and McKee Rankin's uh, collection, his papers, are at some university in Texas, I believe. And there was a letter there. Austin. Austin. And there's a letter there uh, from Ricka Allen, who was an actress in one of Nance's troops, or in her troop. The letter says, it's uh, Ricka writing to Nance, uh, can I have the money you owe me? Uh, because Miss Borden wants her money, and I've already sold all my jewelry, so I don't have any recourse but the money that you owe me to pay her back. Right. And we know from other circumstances that uh, you did not cross Lizzie Borden. She would give you anything in the world if you were loyal to her and you gave her the love that she gave you in return. But that didn't make any sense. <laughs> no, it does because you're talking no, no, about no. somebody the, the, being... No, no, no. The way I said that... No, it's wait, about wait, wait, wait. No, the money. It, yeah. But yeah don't it was, don't it was, mess with money. Uh, you know? Yeah, and it, it was the same thing she, where she, to, she let a chauffeur go because his wife had used Lizzie's name to get credit to buy furniture and then welched on the loan and they came to Lizzie to collect. And... There, again, it's if you're going to use Lizzie's name as a reference, then be faithful to the commitment that you've made. Um, so you've got these little bits and pieces, like Luli's diary. Priceless, priceless. She presents herself full, full bore. She wrote everything down as best she could remember. And she went and did things and partied and socialized and had a like a coming out party and she had Luli was a hell of a kid. Yeah. And and she went to school with Lizzie. With Lizzie. They walked together. Right. And they they well the this is the first time that we get a picture of Lizzie Borden hanging out at the Borden house with her friends. Mm -hmm. Uh, In the diary, Luli, Lizzie, and Rachie, who was Andrew Borden's business partner, Almy, Rachel Almy's, uh, Williams uh, Almy's daughter was Rachie. That's what they call her. And they were just hanging out at the Borden house. Uh, So it's like, you know, Bridget comes in, hey, you guys want some lemonade or, you know. Well, I think she'd say it was an Irish accent. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, well I, I, I'm not going to fake an Irish accent because that might be something like a Welsh <laughs> thing. <laughs> you want some limited now, girls. Yeah. No, so anyway, a lot of little looks at Lizzie as an adolescent, which no one ever knew anything about. No, there were a couple of important stories, actually, that taken by themselves and inserted into what we know about her now... People go, oh, that's it. You know, that's what happened. But it's not. It's just a statement by her friend describing why Lizzie didn't want to go out that day. Mm -hmm. You know, she was feeling blue. Right. Great word. Yes. Because her jail letters feel that way. Mm -hmm. And there's no doubt that you think, well, if she wrote it down, it must be like a more common occurrence than a rare occurrence. You know what I mean? So perhaps she was blue and perhaps she had some depression in her life. It's possible. We will never know. Oh, yeah. But the blue is But she's a a teenage girl. Yeah, exactly. You you know? And then the other thing where she said she fell off a horse? Yeah. They would go riding out at the farm in Swansea. Uh, There's a little episode where they're doing May baskets. They're just like normal things and um it was kind of refreshing to see that um it it wasn't a a diary filled with oh lizzie borden which she was horrible today she you know (laughs) you you know it's just like normal natural stuff that that teenage girls would do and it it was it was a really great diary reading it on the other hand (laughs) tell me about that uh the diary of course is all in cursive in pencil uh, Luli was not extremely fond of punctuation, <laughs> so her sentences tend to ramble, 
and it, it, it's it's like it's like the, the last chapter in James Joyce's Ulysses' <laughs> this stream of consciousness is yeah. like oh, okay, run with it. Go ahead, Luli. But it, all these little snippets uh, uh, throughout are uh, just how are did the terrific. society end up with Luli's diary? A uh, family member who was out on the Cape somewhere, had some things for the collection. Those diaries okay, were among see, them. Okay, this is like how amazing things happen, which is family realize that the curator for this information that's about the history of people who lived in Fall River, if you don't want it, you know, it's a great place to give it, is the society. Uh, read, it will be deciphered, it will be used, mm-hmm. and possibly become important in someone's research. So it's really important for people to consider donating their family papers um, or their family photograph collection if they don't care about them. Oh, right. It, it, and photographs are, and, well, papers and photographs, but photographs are priceless. They are really priced, especially, and, and people don't think about it, but snapshots. Snapshots, to, when you, if you're out on the street, uh, like the neighborhood I grew up in, I, I have some snapshots of like me or my grandmother standing out on the street, and there's a couple of uh, six-family houses behind her, and it, it's a tenement street. But okay, we know what street it is. So it's a picture of that street. Mm-hmm. You know, people aren't going to be uh, photographing tenement streets for souvenir calendars. No, and I remember that you guys went through, like, everything you had in the collection for anybody who took pictures of French Street, either from interesting angles mm-hmm. or up the street or down the street or from, you know, uh, Belmont or from Highland or any direction. And you got some really interesting angles to Maplecroft and the houses around Maplecroft. Yeah, but in, in a lot of cases, because they weren't pictures of the house. Right. It was the picture of the person of who was standing else. in front of that. Yeah, yeah, or next door or whatever. Right. So, you know, yeah, it's fun trying to piece it all together. Oh, but. and then you have some like fabulous photographs from the trial itself. I mean, I know you don't go into. You don't spend a great deal of time on the murders, and the, but you do spend an okay amount of time on the trial. Mm. And you had access, because you are the keeper of the trial exhibits donated by the Waring family, descendants of, of Andrew Jennings, mm-hmm. who was her lawyer, who at the end of the trial, the police weren't going to prosecute anybody else. They weren't looking for another killer. So they the prosecution said we have no need for these photographs and for this, you know, those ground plans and all the evidence that was presented at trial, including the handleless hatchet, you can have this. And so Jennings goes to Lizzie and go, we have all this stuff. What do you want me to do with it? And she's like, I don't care. It's kind of the answer. And he saved it. And he saved it all, everything that he could. So the Historical Society's base collection of Lizzie Borden items that are connected to her come from the trial and her ordeal there. So you've got photographs, you've got the neighborhood, you've got the interior of the house, you've got, they're not crime scene photos because they were taken so much later that day and they were repositioned. But you have the bed spread that was on the bed upstairs that Abby has still has Abby's blood on it and you have the hair switch that was caught off her head and you have the handle of and you have all of these important scientific things that they also used back then right the the, the collection that came in from um, the Jennings family of the Warings were, came to be known as the hip bath collection because that's exactly where all of these things were in the Jennings house. They had been stored there for years and it was Mrs. Waring who, uh, when she was going through things, uh, I don't know if it was prior to a house sale or something like that, but um, this would be in the mid to late 60s, 67-ish around then, and they were given to the Historical Society. And um, the transcripts from the preliminary trial, from the um, inquest, also copies of those, um, and photographs. 
a very interesting collection of photographs also uh, that became part of the defense's exhibits were uh, pictures taken by Arthur Phillips, who was an attorney on the defense team, also later in his life came to write uh, uh, History of Fall River, which is a, a go-to three-volume set of history. Fascicles. Fascicle one, two, and three. Fascicle. Yeah. Never heard that word before or but, since. But these photographs, they're so distinctive because on in the mat, the very thin mats, in Philip's beautiful cursive writing, uh, the descriptions of exactly what is in the photograph. He's actually the one who took the picture that's shown up uh, here, there, and everywhere of the closet in the front hallway yeah. of the uh, Borden house. How about the outside of the house from the street, mm-hmm. from up street and down street? Yeah, he's so showing you, know, you the you neighborhood. Get to know the neighborhood and the ruts in the road and yeah. the tree that's in the, in the road. And the Chinese laundry the across Chinese the street. Laundry, you yeah, know, it, yeah. it, it's... Uh, it, they're perfect atmosphere photographs. They really are, and they and the barn and the backyard mm-hmm. and the side yard, and the yards behind those yards. Right, you know. and the the crow's yard with and all of the, the uh, yeah. stuff all over the place. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is like, this is like Nirvana, like the mother load, like amazing stuff and every once in a while you do a major exhibit yes. where you pull out all the stuff that is always put away because it's so delicate mm-hmm. and you do this big show you know and set up a bed and you yeah know, put the coverlets yeah. on and the pillow shams and you know all that kind of stuff and set it up that way and so that people can have a sense of history that way you know the handle of Sajid is not the murder weapon right but it was presented as if it was like the murder weapon in the same size. It was the right size and shape, right. basically, because Draper fitted into uh, the openings as, and, and that uh, was a swoon moment for Lizzie at the trial, was when uh, Draper did that. But again, it, it never connected. Mm-hmm. So. so you guys, you found all these little stories that people told you about her, anecdotes, day trips, People she knew. Isn't there a great story about an individual that nobody would have thought to talk to? Right, yes. Um, and that came as a total surprise. Oh, uh, how so? Uh, well, when we were working on the book, I, word kind of got out that we were working on a major project. And it, you never quite knew when the phone would ring and it would be at the museum shop upstairs and they say, someone here is here to tell you something about Lizzie Borden. And I said, okay. So Michael and I would trade off. You know, he would take the call, I would take the call, he, you know. So this was his particular call. And um, he went upstairs and then he came back downstairs and he said, uh, I think you want to be up here with me. He said, bring a pad. <laughs> <laughs> So I went upstairs. It was a woman in her 90s. She was there with her nephew. Her father was the foreman at Oak Grove Cemetery. His last name was... Lomax. So Mr. Lomax. (laughs) Mr. Lomax. And she came with a story that said what? Right. Well, that uh, for one, back in the day when winters were quite snowy and uh, there was accumulation at the cemetery, it wasn't uh, usual for people to go visit the graves in the winter months. And uh, Lizzie, on the other hand, did. She would call Mr. Lomax and- uh, Terry. Terry Lomax, yeah. Got it. She would call him and ask him if he would please shovel a path so that she could visit her father's grave. And he would, and he would escort her there. Whenever she went, he would escort her to the grave. And people, of course, would be hawking you know, behind gravestones, and well, Leslie Borden's over there. She's going there to see the father's grave. <laughs> He'd tell her, Miss Borden, he said, don't pay any attention. He said, you're here for that reason. Just do what you're here to do, and then go home. And that was it, and that's what she did, and he watched out for her. And his daughter told us that story, and that oh, was one. A kind, that was a good one. Kind man, yeah. yes. And he ended up uh, being the recipient of a gift, I think. Right, and then he the, the gift the family gave the gift. It was uh, a cut glass, uh, not um, press glass punch bowl set, 
that Lizzie had given to him on, on his wedding. And uh, that is now in the collection of the Historical Society, as well as a set of berry bowls that were given to Luli and her, on her wedding. It's hard to know how many of these events she actually went to or if she didn't attend. Oh, I was thinking that she didn't attend and she just she sent a gift. She would just send gifts, right. yeah. Because she doesn't want it to be about her. Mm-hmm. And if Lizzie Borden showed up at my wedding... <laughs> And I'm the bride. I'd be like, listen, <laughs> I'm the star. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh-huh. But just bridezillas would just not. She probably just politely declined to attend, I, w- I would think, and then send a gift. Yeah. I would think, anyway. And there's evidence of that, so yeah. Yeah, because who wants to upstage the bride? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so... Is there more to be discovered about Lizzie, do you think? Sure. In what areas, what ways? Uh, You said that you saw things that people had that you didn't get, right? No, there there were some things that that, that that we were allowed to use. There are some photographs of things in parallel lives that are not part of our collection that um, we were allowed to have photographed professionally. But... Michael told me that he saw a collection of letters that one day he hopes the society gets, but Mm -hmm. who knows, which are, in effect, love letters. That was before my time, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. I'm I'm sure there are other things out there, but, um, I mean, just because it's not in parallel lives doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It's we by no means uncovered everything that is there to be uncovered. Since it took you like 10 years to write and research this book, you have the ultimate amount of patience that is humanly possible to possess. (laughs) Seriously, because like you said, somebody said, oh, I'll go look up that. I have a collection somewhere in the attic, somewhere, a box of photos or something. And then you just say, okay, and you wait for that person to go figure out that they want to go do that. And then they come down. So this takes time to be patient with people. Mm -hmm. This is not Mm -hmm. like me going, well, would you have mind taking a look now while you're on the phone so I can see if this is something we could follow up with later? No, you just waited for people to do what they were going to do in their own time. And then things presented themselves Mm -hmm. well most people don't do that so i think that as a researcher the level of patience you had with all of the people that you were getting stories from the delicate way in which you allowed them their own time their own space their own way to tell what they wanted to say and how deep they wanted to go in it there was never any prying it was all what stories you want to share i think that that is unique from what I've read of other researchers who write Lizzie Borden books, you know, we know who they are. They, they don't go about with a great deal of patience. They don't go about asking people what they think or what they know. They tell them what they think they know. I think the key, at least as far as what we saw as the key in researching parallel lives is that you have to be patient. You can't get antsy. You can't pressure out any kind of information because then you're going to get people that are not going to be want to be cooperative because you're annoying. And you also can't get frustrated and impatient when you reach a brick wall or a stopping point. Mm-hmm. Because if that's the case, then uh, you'd be done with your research. But no, you know, there's got to be a little way around this. Maybe there's another avenue to pursue. Maybe this wasn't the direction to go in. Right. It, it, you know. it informed how you wrote the book, too. So it depended mm-hmm. on who popped up or who contributed or who had the story that figured into that part of her life that helped tell the story of her life. Mm -hmm. What do you think would be a major find in the Lizzie Borden world? And in what area of her her life do you think it would be in? Like the one thing you want to find that you've never found, or maybe two or three 
that would explain something that's really important for us to understand. Hmm. <laughs> uh, well, diary. Well, there course. wasn't one, though. No, right? there so. wasn't one. Yeah, yeah. August fourth, eighteen ninety-two. Dear diary. Oh, I feel lousy today. <laughs> I feel blue. <laughs> it's it's hard to say. I I mean, I. I mean, her furniture when she died went to at an auction she let her friends take pieces that they wanted well there was some her they, books went one place and then were divided and her personal possessions were uh, allocated there was probably an, with a, a an addendum to the will yeah there was an estate sale somewhere on on um highland avenue around the corner from french street i think after she died there could be well, there probably are a multitude of things out there. Well, okay, it's not going to be stuff that she owned because all of that's been distributed. Distributed. Yeah. So it's going to be in somebody's possession that they have this thing or these things that are going to tell us a whole new area about her life, right? Mm-hmm. Now, I don't mean, you know, her relationship with Nance O'Neill. I'm not talking no, about that no. kind of stuff, which is very i don't know i'm not interested it's not even worth the consideration for the amount of time that it so many people place that relationship as the central reason why why emma left but the timing doesn't work no and and when you look at that relationship um it's okay fine lizzie had a hell of a time for a few months she went to some parties and maybe it was totally totally unlike any life that she had ever lived before. But it was at a price because she was being used financially. Right. So she loaned a little bit of money and she went to some house parties and it was all done. And then when Nance O'Neill was interviewed at one point after the fact, uh, she said they were like two ships that passed in the night. Exactly, yeah. Lizzie didn't want to pull up and moor next to Nance O'Neill's boat because it would have cost her a lot of money. Yeah, really. Yeah. 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 And that's the whole thing. I mean, these are theater people. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to go to a party in their honor. You know, they're going to drink that champagne. You know, they, this is, this is, this is what they live for, this kind of after the theater stuff that goes on. But it's other people pay for it. They don't host their own parties. They're glommers on to people who have wealth that enjoy going to the theater. Yeah, and that's documented yep. on paper. Yep. So, I mean, it, it's not a supposition that we're, we're dealing with here. It's something that uh, has actually been put down on paper. So why did Emma leave? I think, and this is a totally uh, personal opinion, Emma and Lizzie had two totally different ways of living. No kidding. Emma was much more retiring in nature. And Lizzie, I think, refused to give in to being buried by what happened to her in 1892 and 3. She refers to it uh, as running away when she goes to D.C., when she goes away from Fall River. On August 4th. Uh, Every year. She would run away because it was in the papers and right. And it's interesting. There was one uh, incident where she left, and it actually coincided with this newspaper article that we found and some in police watchbooks. Um, there were a series of break-ins in the French Street area, and it coincided with one of the times that Lizzie ran away to Washington, D.C. Now you just got to wonder, I mean, is, does she just not want to be home if somebody's going to break into her house? You know? Oh, yeah. She would get nervous. Yeah. And she documented in correspondence that she would run away. So... She never, uh, she never gave an interview. She never wrote a diary. She never talked about it right to anybody right not to my knowledge no it, and if she had written except a Emma, di- possibly yeah. yeah but if she had written a diary i think that uh, she would have left instructions to have it burned upon her death anyway 
<laughs> she never mentioned it, but mo mostly people only mention their diaries in their diaries. Uh, so that wouldn't really <laughs> do any good. But well, Emma leaves in what, 1904? 1904. 1904. Yeah. So and she leaves uh, in the spring, right? Mm hmm. But the. But the, the to do the to do party was the winter before. before that. So it's not like oh we had a horrible party here and there was sex everywhere and I'm gonna go visit my minister and he's gonna tell me that I need to get out of there with you know for my own sanity. No, and, and then and then again if you look at the, the look at the chronology, she had been thinking about leaving for quite some time. It wasn't like the newspapers made, made it sound like a U-Haul pulled up to the house and she had somebody like take all her furniture out and stuff it in the U-Haul and drive uh, down the street to the Buck's house and, you know, just move in there. She had actually talked to Reverend Buck about her relationship with her sister prior to leaving and Buck had been dead for a couple of years by the time she left. Right. So she'd been thinking of it for a yeah, long time. Yeah, that's not something that did, like just popped into her head. And I think I'll move. And this is the pre-theater, Lizzie, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. you know, I have an older sister who I love, who's nine years older than I am, which is Lizzie's sister is eight years older than she is, right? Thirty-two and nine. forty. 51 and 60 birth dates. Nine years. So same as me and my sister. I love my sister. I don't want to live with her because <laughs> she's mom. You know, she's always, she's older. She has advice mm. about everything. She is, she wants you to think before you do something, you know. And, and you know, she's like in your head and like. Well, what was it? Well, great, le great advice. Not poo-pooing her advice uh -huh. but i don't want to live around that all the time because i have to make my own mistakes well, you what, know wasn't it the uh, hitchcock episode that was titled the older, older sister, sister. <laughs> yeah i mean but i can just say you know they had lived together until 1904 mm -hmm. how old is emma at that point she's born in 51 so she's 51 to I ran out of toes. <laughs> <laughs> to 1904. It's 53 years. Yeah. She's 53 years old, and she's never lived by herself. Oh. Think about it. It's time, Emma, because we can't live together anymore. Because we, we can't. It's just we can't. No, and and like I said before, it, it, they their lifestyles were so different. Um, their friends were different. Yeah, and and Lizzie enjoyed the theater, and she enjoyed traveling. And we're not saying that Emma didn't, because Emma traveled too. She went to Scotland. Emma went to Mardi Gras. Yeah, I know. We know that. Just the image of that. I just can't imagine. But uh, in California too, right? Yeah, California. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, but th very different approach. I mean, you can just tell by uh, the things that they did that we know of that if they were like apples and oranges. They really were. They were very different from one another. And a part of it is, of course, one is older. It has mm -hmm. everything to do yeah. with that. And so... And being a maternal figure. Right. Oh, my goodness. At the and same being time. Sad, take care oh, of take baby care. Lizzie. Exactly. You know. And that would be like, okay, I've had enough mothering Emma, you know? Uh -huh. I mean, it's time for you to... You've got money. Go on. And it was a mutual breakup. That's why there's nothing to say. There's nothing that caused it. There's nothing precipitating it. It was time mm -hmm. that they didn't want to live with each other anymore. Plus, who's running the household? Of course, Lizzie wanted to run her household and wanted to hire and have more of a say in hiring and firing. So I imagined it was a little bit of that, too. Mm -hmm. you know? right. And so Emma goes around the corner down the street. <laughs> <laughs> to the buck house yeah, we're, we're, with the stick over her shoulder with a little <laughs> bag with her belongings in it. oh like, <laughs> like beaver cleaver yeah. pretending to run away and then she ends up in uh 
uh, Providence. Providence living yeah. with the Gardner family on Hope Street. And then she ends up living in uh, the Minden house. Yeah, the, the apartment building. Right. Yes. And that, mm-hmm. that was probably the first time she lived alone in her whole life was the Minden house. Don't you think? Right. Because she wasn't living with family or friends. Right. Because the Gardners were cousins. Mm-hmm. Then Oren gets her hooked up to uh, Newmarket, New Hampshire. And she lives there mm-hmm. with a nurse, correct? Yes. And in this house. And so she's here and there. She comes and goes in the story. She's, she's much more of an enigma, actually, than Lizzie has become because we know far less about her than mm-hmm. we know about Lizzie. Far less. We don't... I mean, if somebody were to try to figure out her life and try to figure out what she was all about and her personality, I'd really like to know. Because we don't know anything about her, really. Right. It would be interesting to see if we liked her. Exactly. (laughs) Because we do like Lizzie in this book, you know, because other people liked her. Yeah. 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 You come away with a very different uh, picture. She's not uh, an accident waiting to happen. No. She's not a terror, and she's not scary, and she's not inappropriate like all these gossipy things make her is mm-hmm. entirely inappropriate she's not like that at all oh. no and she goes and visits her dad's grave i mean oh that doesn't sound like guilt to me but well, or maybe e- it does who even, knows well even her um burial instructions ask that she be buried at her father's feet and um <laughs> another great episode um the man who was a foreman at uh, Oak Grove Cemetery when we were working on the book uh, took us out there and um, he showed us. He brought us out to the Borden lot and he had a divining rod that would search for uh, moisture or pockets of moisture underground. And the the... I don't know the technology behind this, but... I don't think it's technology. <laughs> yeah. No, but he would hold it and would move uh, uh, in a certain way. when Right. It, it, I know it, how they work. Yeah. Right. And it's supposed to find underground streams. He uses it to find out where certain things are... Uh, under b- the ground? Bo- uh, bodies are buried under the ground because that would be... There would be... Collection of water? Yes. Ew. And he found at... The, what would be the foot of Andrew's grave, something uh, underground. Right. So these are headstones or footstones? Head. They are headstones. Okay. Huh. Interesting. Why is her name misspelled on the monument? I don't know. <laughs> that was another thing you guys discovered. The <laughs> monument manufacturer, the monument maker for the Oak Grove Cemetery monument for the Borden family. Oh, that that was a that was a trip. That was a nice trip. I mean, that was amazing. I mean, who would have think? Oh, let's go find out because it says at the bottom the name of the yeah, of the creator. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and that the man, he was a very very elderly man. Uh, he's oh, since passed away. I th- I think he passed away shortly after we actually saw him. He let us have the um, the plans scanned to use as an illustration of the book. He was still very old school about it. He, you know, he, he wasn't working anymore. He, I don't know if he just like kind of came out of the house to meet with us or something. <laughs> <laughs> but very, very nice man. And um, I understand it's still in the family, but I, at this point we're uh, probably a few generations away from... Uh, from. That's the risky part of your patience part. The risk of being patient, the risk involved with being patient with people is that the people who care slowly die off and the people who don't care end up with the stuff and don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. There's scary times because we're getting into a generation where it has to be instilled in someone to care about these things. They're not going to naturally care about family history, Mm -hmm. no matter how many shows are on TV about it. People are less involved in that genealogy of their lives. And 
I guess it's just a generational thing. But people want to know where they came from and who they knew and if they knew any famous people. But Lizzie's story in that regard with these people who may be, you know, third grandchild, great, great, great grandchild mm -hmm. of these people, if they end up with a box of mementos, they don't know what they've got. You know, there's the sadness of it without getting it from the people who know yes. its value and yeah. its, its importance in history. You know, that's the sad part, but it, that's the way it works, right? Yeah. Uh, the and, and police department threw everything out, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've only heard that story, so I don't. I I wasn't around when that all transpired. Michael said they were dumpster diving for stuff because mm. they were moving from some place to some place, mm -hmm. and uh, from one building to another, and they just had to get rid of everything. And so there you go. I want I want you to be the respect the recipients of more history, mm -hmm. not just Lizzie Borden. No, but, no. But everybody has a story to tell. Actually, we never even really touched on the social history aspect. We kind of got off on the wayside. From <laughs> yeah, but yeah, but it was a good. It was a good over an hour now. So that's a good. That's a yeah. good place to break off because, and we still have to talk about next. The Jennings Journals and the Knowlton Pearson correspondence. Yes. And then possibly what's in the works in the future, like another 10 years. <laughs> 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 but next time when we talk, I will have had more of a, a, of, a, of a hand to play in the production of those works. So I, oh, I true. will have a lot to say about those books and what... I went through also as a researcher trying to find out information and how much I look up to you for being able to decipher handwriting. Oh, my gosh. Just <laughs> oh, just one letter. I love You're it. Stuck though. on I, one I letter. And I, we could blow it up. Remember, I would take pictures yeah. and blow it up and then send it to you and go, my, what is that? Is that a T or an L? <laughs> my favorite thing is when you kind of sneak up on it. You get it like enlarged on your computer screen and you walk away from it and then you kind of like take a quick glance at it and there it is <laughs> i know what it says a lot of times that's with names because uh -huh. the names don't look real and then you find out that they were real you know but that'll be the jennings journals we'll talk about that but perfect i thank you once again for inviting me over and us having this big long conversation about parallel lives i knew it would take its own its own mm -hmm. its own episode and so i guess there'll be a part three i guess tune in soon Thank you, and thank you, Dennis. Very okay, much. thank you for having me. <laughs> you mean thank you for being had? <laughs> <laughs> See ya. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Lizzie Borden podcast, episode twenty-nine. We've been talking to Dennis Bennett about researching Fall River history and the Lizzie Borden case. Be sure to look out for our next installment, part three, of this most interesting talk on our next podcast. Find Richard Barron's Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Stories at Amazon.com and at LizzieBordenGirlDetective.com, where you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Listen to more Lizzie Borden podcasts on our website or on Podbean, Audible, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, and YouTube.